This webinar is going to address the remote visual inspection NDE method of fluorescent penetrant inspection. I'm Tom Britton. I'm an application specialist with Waygate Technologies visual inspection business headquartered in Skinny Atlas, New York. If you would like to follow up with any questions to me later on, my email address is tom.britton at bakerhughes.com. And so the agenda I'm going to do today is just start with an FPI overview go through um, a general FPI process and then describe what components we as Waygate uh, can supply to that inspection process. Describe some of the technical specifications that uh, our equipment uh, is in compliance with when uh, properly configured and properly applied. Go through those industry specifications themselves by just by name as far as uh, what we our current um, products uh, are in compliance with. Describe and show uh, just a, a bit on the uh, Mentor Visual IQ and the XL Flex and Detect products, which have uh, UV um, custom solutions available. Uh, we take our standard product and we make custom versions, and I'll be talking about that. And then get into some of the applications uh, that are uh, necessary to understand um, the technical specifications. And when someone wants to do an FBI inspection, uh, they're generally going to come to you and uh, and you or or your customer, depending on uh, uh, who, who you are in, in our audience here tonight, are going to need to resolve a, a certain indication of a certain size. And you're going to need to uh, understand uh, whether our equipment is capable of doing that. And uh, what's generally used is the 1951 Air Force target. And I'll walk through uh, what that is and how it's used in the specifications and how we comply with that with our different um, uh, optical tip adapters. And then uh, I'll get into uh, actually choosing an optical tip adapter for a specific application and then go and describe the fact that we can perform uh, linear measurements, meaning linear, I mean point to point and point to line. And if the area is all on, a, on the same plane, we can do area measurements under UV light. And then I'm going to have a couple application examples. So let's uh, just start with a quick overview of what is fluorescent penetrant inspection. And so on the right-hand panel here is a, uh, an image that is done on a vessel uh, showing a crack in a vessel wall that uh, FPI was used to highlight where that crack was. Uh, in, in Under white light inspection, it was very difficult to see this cracking under fluorescent penetrant, it became uh, quite apparent. So fluorescent penetrant, it's a type of non-destructive testing. It's an NDT method used to detect linear indications, surface cracks, and other defects in parts. And what is done is a fluorescent dye is applied to the surface of a non-porous material. It's typically a metal type of, of material to detect defects in that surface. You don't want the fluorescent penetrant to actually be absorbed by the surface. You want the fluorescent dye to become stuck in the indication. In this, in this example here, the, the fluorescent penetrant dye went down into this crack and was stuck in there. And so there are uh, international um, standards, one of them being the ASTM E1417, which is a very common standard which is invoked in performing FPI inspections. And it tells you how to prepare this surface for performing an FPI inspection as far as spraying the fluorescent penetrant material on, letting it dwell for a certain time, how to clean it off, and then potentially even um, using some type of, of a, a secondary uh, developer to bring the uh, fluorescent penetrant dye to the surface. So after you've cleaned it, the dye that has become stuck, if you introduce a UVA light and typically what's what has been done in the non rvi version of that is there will be a handheld illuminator or maybe an entire um black uh, a black light room that would be used to uh illuminate under black light a uh, properly prepared fpi um, uh, inspection specimen but uh, when you introduce uh uv light into it the dye penetrant, which was stuck into the defect, will glow as is shown here. And so FPI has been around for quite a while. It's a very low cost and simple process um, to uh, perform 
uh, surface uh, defect inspection uh, identification in a variety of industries. So the steps in performing an FPI, uh, as I said, is uh, you have to first um, initially clean the part. You want to get surface dirt and surface uh, corrosion off. You want to make sure that you are actually looking uh, at the, uh, the, the integral surface for where there are cracks and where there are pits. Um, you would then apply the penetrant. And now applying the penetrant could be done in a, a number of ways. Uh, you could use a spray can. Here's a couple. Uh, here's Metal Check and um, Magnaflux have uh, spray can versions of penetrant application. They also have cleaners and uh, uh, developers as well. Um, there are uh, there are uh, suppliers of tanks where you can actually submerge a part to be inspected into a tank. You would submerge it. You would then uh, let let it dwell for a while. You could then walk off. So there there is a there is an entire industry supporting um, the FPI inspection technologies. Um, that we are not a manufacturer of any of this. We are not a reseller of any of this. So. To apply the penetrant in a remote visual uh, location down inside of an asset, down into a gearbox, down into an engine, you've got to get the penetrant spray down in there and you've got to be able to prepare the surface in accordance with these international standards. We don't have a tool to be able to do this. There are actually um, a couple of people who have um, delivery tools, one of them being Richard Wolf. Um, if you're familiar with uh, other competitors to Waygate in the video boroscope and video uh, inspection business, Richard Wolf is a, a very old supplier of uh, rigid boroscopes uh, and fiberscopes. They have a tool that our video probe can actually go inside of their delivery tool and watch the spraying of uh, FPI fluid. I believe uh, eFair in France also has a uh, FPI delivery tooling system. Again, we, we as uh, RVI, uh, Waygate Technologies, do not um, sell this equipment. So once you've come up with a process to deliver the FPI, you have to let it dwell for a certain time. Then you have to remove the excess penetrant. Uh, you may or may not have to apply what's called a developer. So once you've wiped the excess penetrant off, you can spray on this secondary uh, material, which is called a developer, that actually pulls uh, the uh, the stuck uh, FBI fluid in the crack up to the surface so it'll be more apparent when you uh, illuminate it with UV light. And then you perform the inspection. So this is this has got a star here. This is what we do. Uh, we don't do any of this part. This is up to the uh, up to you as uh, performing the inspection to come up with all of this um, part of the process. Uh, finally, after performing the inspection, uh, in order to not leave what might be corrosive material on the part, uh, you need to perform a final cleaning on the part. Um, let me talk about performance requirements to perform an FPI inspection. Again, these industry standards uh, require uh, uh, three, three different um, core um, metrics be met in order to uh, perform an FPI in compliance with the standards. And so let me start with saying all of the standards require a minimum amount of UV energy must be delivered to the surface being inspected. And uh, there's, there is um, sometimes confusion if uh, the wrong section of a standard is, uh, is, is referred to or if maybe an older standard is referred to. As I said earlier, there used to be um, uh, just a standard that would have either a large uh, room type of illumination or a handheld illuminator and a, just your eyeball or an eyeball in a mirror to do the inspection. Under those conditions, they talked about UV energy uh, being required to be a certain amount, and it's measured in microwatts of UV energy per centimeter squared. And there are many um, now, at this point, relatively inexpensive, high-quality um, uh, photometric tools that can be used to measure this light energy. But they used to require it to be done at a distance of 15 inches. 
And so the, most of the world standards have been changed um, so that uh, they address using a video boroscope. And they pretty much universally say that the energy that they're going to require in microwatts per centimeter square is going to be at the inspection distance. And so I think everyone who is familiar with video boroscopes understands that for the most part, the inspection distance of a typical video boroscope inspection is probably um, like 150 millimeters or less. And so depending on what type of resolution you're looking for, you may actually be down at uh, 10 to 20 millimeters performing a UV inspection. So this is the first metric we have to meet. We have to provide a minimum amount of UV energy at the inspection surface at the distance we're performing the inspection. The next thing is you have to have a, a limit on the amount of white light component that's in the UV light that you're projecting. So we use a, a UV light source, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but the UV light source um, cannot have uh, a significant amount of white light because the white light would tend to um, suppress the green fluorescing that happens if there's too much white light. And so white light is actually called pollution under these conditions. So there's a limit on the amount of white light pollution that can be part of your UV energy, which is being uh, illuminated. And I'll talk about the specific um, limits of uh, in microwatts and in lux and foot candles on these in a moment. And then the third thing that has to be addressed is, can your optical system resolve the uh, size of the defect you're looking for? So if you are looking for, say, a, uh, a, a 25 thousandths, 0 0.0025 indication, you've got to make sure that your optical system can resolve that. And uh, we we have um, published um, specifications and our technical support organization can help you in determining the various resolution capabilities of our video boroscopes at different distances. Because just as a, as a quick reference, our video boroscopes are not like uh, zoom SLR cameras. Our focus is fixed. And so our magnification as you get closer and closer to a target increases and you get you get the ability to resolve smaller and smaller defects the closer you get. So you may find that in order to satisfy all of these requirements, you need to have a specific tip at a specific distance. So you're meeting the UV energy, you have a minimum of white light uh, that is part of that UV, and your video boroscope with its associated optical tip can resolve the uh, indication that is required uh, as part of your inspection. So where these three these three metrics come in together, that's that's your that's how you have to choose your inspection component. And so I talked about the OEM standard. So the ASTM uh, E1417 is probably the most uh, universally used in North America. Um, it actually describes the UV irradiance, right? When you talk about irradiance, uh, you're talking about the UV energy of a thousand microwatts per centimeter square at, at the at the inspection distance. And then it also says the maximum white light pollution at that distance cannot exceed 21.5 lux or two foot candles. Foot candles and lux are just two different um, uh, ways of describing the white light uh, component of the uh, of the light that comes out. And just as another side note, uh, white light pollution used to be more of a problem before the advent of UV LEDs, because in order to create UV, you act actually had to filter out white light so that the only thing that was projected was UV light. With the advent of UV LEDs, um, the white light uh, pollution problem is really, really very, very minimal, and we don't run into white light pollution as really any significant challenge to meeting the uh, specifications of uh, industry standards. Uh, another, uh, the European standard, ISO uh, 3059, is very similar to um, the E1417. It also requires uh, 1,000 microwatts per centimeter square at the inspection distance. It sets a little bit lower white light uh, pollution spec of 20 lux as opposed to 21.5. Um, there's another ISO standard that is uh, more associated with um, surface preparation, ISO 3452. Um, getting into industry standards now, um, uh, we really, this whole presentation,
information um, was pulled together because of the knowledge that our business gained in order to respond to an opportunity to uh, work on a custom tool that was uh, going to be applied to meet a GE Aviation uh, requirement that was being put out commercially. And GE Aviation um, calls their uh, requirements for um, third-party MRO shops. Uh, they're under the terminology SPM, meaning Standard Practice Manual. So there is an SPM associated with UV inspections. Um, uh, and this is the number 703202 uh, that describes the GE Aviation UV light levels and light pollution levels. There are also two additional uh, GE calls on P-specs, uh, P3T44 and P3TF47, that uh, we are required to meet in order to be compliant with uh, a GE requirements. I don't have the, uh, the details of this. These are proprietary documents. If uh, you uh, perform inspections for GE, if you uh, have a, a, a GTA, a general terms and agreements with GEA as a MRO, uh, you will have access to these through GE. And then uh, additional uh, re um, specification that you might run into is another ASTM spec. And uh, I just put this up here because um, you should know that this is a specification that is not applicable to uh, boroscope light sources. Uh, you read through the specs. This was a this was copied out of the spec. So if if we're being asked to meet this with a with an RVI type of UV inspection, you can go and look into the details of that spec and find the fact that this practice is not applicable. Um, Another common inspection requirement is our RES 90061. This is a Rolls-Royce OEM spec. This is really written around the UV light source and the requirements for it. And uh, there are a variety of different um, specifications included in it for different application type of environments that, uh, again, contact us. We've, we've been able to meet this specification um, with, with our devices. Well, well, we'll continue on. So let me just... Um, uh, finalize this discussion around industry standards to say that our video boroscope um, can be configured to meet most international OEM FPI standards when configured properly. When I say configured properly, that means you have set up our probe to be at a distance where we'll meet the resolution. You have tested to make sure that uh, the light output, you've got it at a, a distance where our UV energy on the surface meets the industry specifications and um, that the, you don't uh, have an excess of white light. So uh, it's up to the, the client, the, the, the organization which is performing the FPI inspection. There is a, a level three certified um, inspector to make sure that they have tested the, to ensure that they, the setup that they are using to perform the FPI um, meets all of these metrics that I've described here. Uh, these, uh, all of these standards are, are, are readily available on the web. There's a number of organizations, including the ASTM and, and, uh, and ISO uh, norm organization, uh, that are happy to sell them to you. So let's, let's talk about um, the, the video boroscopes that can provide UV inspection. So what do we, what do we have to do to make a UV boroscope? Well, the first thing we have to do is have a source of UV uh, light. And so we do not have UV light built into any of our boroscope products. We have to use an external light source. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a future slide. But uh, what we have is a special version of a video probe that will take an external light source uh, and, uh, and, and channel that light energy from the light box through a light guide into our product and back out to the tip so that we can project UV energy. The second thing we have to do is put on a filter because if, if you just look with a regular video boroscope at a UV image, it's going to look like this. Our, our CCD imager is incredibly sensitive to the UV spectrum and it will be just flooded and overwhelmed with a pink image and you won't see any green at all. But if you put a filter in there to block UV, and that's what we do, we put a filter right, right there in the tip, we put a filter, you'll turn an image that looks like this into an image that looks like this. And you can see your green fluorescent uh, indication uh, jump out and uh, the, the UV energy will be suppressed. So here's, here's the, 
UV configuration for a, a Mentor Visual IQ. Um, as everyone is aware, the Mentor Visual IQ has interchangeable probes. This is the um, uh, picture of the interchangeable UV probe. Here's the traditional, uh, people will call it a WIP, the video boroscope probe coming out of the um, fixed connection of a light guide coming out the side of it. Note that the UV light source is actually a dual UV white light combination light source and you would just rotate the turret at the front end of the light source in order to switch between UV and white light. So you can turn it into white light mode and navigate your way to the inspection and then switch it over to UV mode. It also has an intensity control here from uh, you know zero to 100 percent of UV energy it controls the light output of the lamp itself. So the, the Mentor Visual IQ um, is a very powerful uh, video boroscope. As everyone knows, it's essentially a laptop computer, a Windows 10 laptop computer. And, and what we're able to do is a significant amount of image processing in there to enhance the, um, the image itself. And one of the enhancements we do is to boost the green light spectrum to make it easier to see the fluorescent uh, penetrant as it's fluorescing under UV uh, excitation. And so what we have is an imaging mode tile that will pop up on the menu. And uh, any, of, any of the people that are in the audience right now who own video boroscopes will say, well, I never saw that on my Mentor Visual IQ. Where is it? Well, it's in the image menu, but you're not going to see this particular imaging mode tile, the soft button, unless you actually have a video probe that is a UV probe plugged in, because this system will automatically detect, oh, I have a UV video probe, and it'll provide you this imaging mode that'll let you go into this enhanced uh, imaging uh, display mode. So here are all the uh, the different, I'm not going to go through all these, but just, just be aware that we've had a, a number of customers come and say, gee, I need a... Uh, a 3.5 meter, 4 millimeter uh, version of your Mentor Visual IQ. So we go ahead and we make that uh, that particular version. And so I think there was one other thing I didn't say is that this this is uh, often uh, in in uh, in UV inspections you'll use either a liquid light guide or a quartz light guide. We actually have quartz fibers that that uh, we have a we have no break in the fiber, so we have maximum light transmission right from the point of this, this coupler right here, all the way through the light guide, all the way through the product, all the way out to the tip. So this, is, this has quartz fibers. So that's one of the components that makes the video boroscope a custom product, is that it has quartz illumination fibers. It also has that UV filter in the camera tip. So here are all the quick change probes for the Mentor Visual IQ that are available. And if, if we don't have what you are looking for on this list, um, it just takes a little bit longer for our engineering team to go and specify up uh, what is the proper quartz fiber bundle and to make the bill of materials to be able to allow us to manufacture it. The XL Flex and Detect products also have the ability to be configured uh, with a uh, video uh, boroscope uh, for video UV video boroscope inspections by attaching an external light guide. Again, this has got a uh, light guide um, cable that, that comes out and you just plug it in just like the, the uh, Mentor Visual IQ into an external light source. And so these are, these are the um, video boroscope uh, lengths and diameters that are available in the Flex and Detect today. And so the, the tip adapters themselves are uh, for the 8 millimeter product, there are no special tip adapters. For our 6 millimeter products, we found that uh, we, we were losing some UV energy going through the tip itself. I think, as you're aware, when you screw on an optical tip adapter to the end of our video probe to change the field of view or the depth of field, um, we have to conduct the light from the end of the probe through the tip to be able to um, properly fill the, uh, the inspection area. And we found that uh, for certain six millimeter tips uh, that it, we were not optimized to transmit the uh, UV energy through there. So we came up with special tips. So, 
just be aware that if you have a six millimeter uh, application, you would uh, want to select um, custom six millimeter tips, which are optimized for UV light transmission. This is how we ship the uh, UV probes uh, for the Mentor Visual IQ. It has its own storage case uh, that has got room for the, um, the external light guide as well as the insertion tube to just kind of wrap around in this track. It uh, has room to store the UV light source and the power supply for the light source. And it's got a, a little bit of an extra cavity that's uh, available to have some other accessory items such as uh, some test targets, some test blades, uh, or a, uh, a light meter. The, uh, the UV products available from Waygate Technologies are available on our website. So the, there's a specific data sheet for the uh, Mentor Visual IQ. I, I believe there is a data sheet for our XL View product. I don't know if we've released our XL Flex uh, product yet, but um, contact us uh, for, for specific information on, on those products. And then there's also a um, cell sheet that is for our uh, switchable white light, UV light, light source. Uh, it's our part number. We do resell this part. It's our part number, ELS-50LED-UV. It's a 50-watt um, UV, uh, UV light source. It's a 35-watt uh, white light source combination. So it's, again, as you rotate this turret on the front, you can rotate from UV light energy output to white light energy output, and you can change the intensity from zero to 100% with this little knob on the side. So I said before um, uh, in the introduction, I was gonna talk about the US Air Force 1951 target. And one of the metrics that we have to meet is um, the fact that you have to provide uh, the ability to resolve a, a certain size of defect. And what is typically used is the U.S. Air Force 1951 target, which has a series of, uh, of uh, lines and spaces. Um, this is a fluorescent version of the 1951 target. What's typically used is a uh, black and white version for standard uh, white light uh, optics. This is the um, fluorescent version that we use for our validation testing. And so what, what a given inspection is going to require is that they will say, I need to have an inspection system which can resolve, say, for instance, group one element five on the U.S. Air Force 1951 target. Well, what does that mean? Well, go go to the web and, and uh, there are hundreds of people who have got uh, copies of this U.S. 1951 target and the associated table. So you go here and you say, okay, Group one, element five, this is group zero, are these very uh, lower resolution targets. This is group one right here. Here's group two right here. Here's group three right here. And they go down four, five, and six. That's not shown on this particular target. But let's say, for example, someone wants me to be able to resolve group one, element five. That says that, that I need to be able to clearly see the difference between lines and spaces for this test target pattern right here. And I have to do it at the, I have to set my probe to be able to do that. And that might require me to come closer to be able to actually resolve this group one element five. And when you look at group one element five up in the table, that says that for this particular pattern, there are 3.17 line pairs. That means a green stripe and a black bar. Uh, so a stripe and a bar is a line pair. So there are 3.17 of those in a single millimeter. And so that's how you read this table. So if someone says, I want to resolve group one element five, they mean I want to be able to see defects so small that 3.17 of these little lines uh, are uh, per millimeter can be resolved. So there's also a number of uh, commercial test coupons that are available. Um, this is uh, just showing one here's uh, and, and, uh, and many processes, many uh, FPI processes require uh, that uh, an inspector actually validate that his fluorescing material is still um, capable of fluorescing properly. And so they have to generally spray a test coupon and test their equipment, test their materials 
um, for for still having the ability to fluoresce properly. As the material gets older, it doesn't fluoresce as well as when it's new. So here is one that has a series of cracks that is used for you spray it on, you wipe it off, you prepare it properly, and then you resolve whether you can see that. Here is a, uh, this has an epoxy impregnated um, fluorescing material as these do here. So here's a 0.7 millimeter, that's what this little spot is here. Here's a 1.1 millimeter defect, there's that spot there, and here's one that's 1.5. So these are again available commercially. Just go to go to the web and, and look for um, FBI test targets, test coupons. So now comes a very busy slide that says, how do I choose the right tip to be able to meet all of these specifications, right? I told you I've got to have a certain minimum energy specification. I've got a certain maximum white light specification, and I've got to resolve um, the defect size, right? Somebody's going to throw at me, hey, I want you to see group one element five, and then so I've got to be able to resolve that. So I've got to say, how do I choose a video probe, and what position do I put it in to meet all of this? And so they're also going to say, and by the way, when I meet all of this, what is my field of view? So we in our engineering and technical support organization have got all the answers to answer all of these questions and to work with you um, to be able to come up and choose the right um, tip to be able to perform uh, an inspection that is in compliance with whatever international or OEM standards you're you are working with uh, at a given time. So let's let's start with what is what is the access to the inspection? How big a video probe can I put in? Because just like a white light inspection, I think in general you want to always use the largest diameter video probe, one, because it's more robust and less likely to be damaged, and two, because that bigger diameter has room for more quartz fibers to have more UV light to be able to deliver to, to the target. So for this particular application that I'm showing here, I was not restricted by uh, having to fit through a boroscope port that, like, for instance, could only allow a 6-millimeter probe. This particular application would let me have an 8-millimeter um, video probe, so that's what I've chosen. So now I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to choose an 8-millimeter video probe tip. Now I've got to say, where, where can I meet the resolution requirements and the UV energy requirements? So I start looking through my range of tips, and I, I find that my yellow tip can actually give me this one. Uh, for this particular application, I'm looking for 1,200 microwatts um, per centimeter squared based on this, this specific application. So I ask, where, where does my yellow tip run out of UV energy? How far tip-to-target distance, this is, this is this, the, the x-axis is tip-to-target distance, Here's my 1,200 microwatt limit. Anything further to the right here, I don't have enough UV energy to meet my UV energy minimum spec. So that says I have to operate down in this zone right here. The second thing I want to know is white light energy. Well, I actually have no problem at all uh, for my yellow tip from 10 millimeters further out. So from anything from 10 millimeters out here, I, I don't have any, any issues whatsoever. And I probably want to be as far out as possible so I've got a maximum field of view. So that says I would really like to operate right here at this 1,200 microwatt UV energy limit. But what do I have for resolution? Well, that's what this curve is right here. The y-axis right here is the Air Force test target resolution in line pairs per millimeter. So remember I said back here, 3.17 was what I was looking for for a group one element five. So this particular customer is saying, hey, I've got to have a minimum of group one element five resolution. Well, that ends up translating to 3.17 line pairs per millimeter. Well, if I, if I say, gee, I want to be as far out as possible so I can see as wide a field of view as possible and still meet my resolution specs, I probably would like to operate like right here. And so at that point right there, you can see that I'm operating at somewhere around four and a half uh, line pairs per millimeter, you know, which is greater than the 3.17. So that's no problem at all. So out at this point, which ends up being 55 millimeters from, from tip to target, 
I, again, uh, we have this information. We're happy to work with you as a customer, as a reseller, to provide this data. So at 55 millimeters, we can view an area here, the XYZ dimensions of 3.6 inches by 2.5 by 4.6. So that says that I've chosen my eight millimeter product. I'm going to set it at 55 millimeters away. I'm going to be able to see an area that is 91 millimeters by 65 with a diagonal of 116. I've got 1200 microwatts of UV energy and my resolution is up in the four and a half line pairs per millimeter, far exceeding the 3.17 required. That is kind of uh, this uh, this particular slide. That was a lot of information, and I will pause here. Um, I said earlier that uh, I was going to talk about um, our ability to do stereo measurements. You'll find that in certain specifications, uh, in addition to performing the, the optical ability, your eyes to resolve a defect of a given size, you may have to actually go in and measure that defect. And so uh, we can actually, under UV energy, under UV illumination, we can perform stereo measurements. We can perform traditional stereo measurements, and we can perform 3D stereo measurements. We've found that if the surface is prepared very, very well, there actually won't be very much residual um, penetrant material left on the surface around and it may be difficult to form a point cloud. In this particular one, the surface probably was not prepared well, and that's why I can actually see a 3D point cloud visualization of this area. Uh, but you'll find that, uh, you know, I think you're, you're familiar with the fact that our systems uh, use the same tip for traditional stereo and 3D stereo. So if you've, if you've invested in 3D stereo, um, you can uh, switch back and forth between traditional stereo and 3D stereo. Uh, to be able to achieve the best uh, indication, the best uh, ability to see the indication. Um, the resolution that we have is the same resolution and accuracy uh, that we have for our white light stereo measurements. And, and this is true because what you're actually measuring is, is a green uh, indication. And a green indication is not UV, that, that UV energy has caused the FBI material material to fluoresce in the green spectrum, and the green is in the middle of the white light spectrum. So it, this is completely consistent that our accuracy standards, and we publish accuracy curves in our um, uh, measurement handbook. The measurement handbook for Mentor Visual IQ remote visual products is up on our website, and we have curves that, that tell you at a given distance from an indication what the uh, error would be, what the indicated error would be under ideal conditions of properly placing cursors, properly preparing the surface, um, what, what our system error would be for performing uh, linear uh, stereo measurements and 3D stereo measurements. There was a question earlier, of, uh, we have another 3D measurement technique called 3D phase measurement. 3D phase measurement actually uses um, visible red LEDs to project a, a structured light pattern onto a target. We do not have a UV version of our 3D phase, so you are, you are restricted to choosing between traditional stereo or 3D stereo only. This is not applicable to 3D phase uh, technology. But the, the 3D stereo, as you're aware, you can see the point cloud with 3D stereo. As part of uh, every measurement system that Waygate Technologies provides, every video boroscope measurement system, we provide a measurement verification block. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar with our measuring video boroscope systems, this block is provided as a component to ensure that your system is still capable of measuring accurately. A video boroscope is not required to have regular regular calibration intervals. We calibrate our device in our factory. It goes out the door with a certificate of calibration. And unless you damage it somehow, all of our optics are glued in place with uh, high temperature epoxies. And so unless you mechanically damage it or you put it into an engine that, which is too hot and it, it exceeds the, the temperature of our epoxies and the optics move around somehow, that device is generally um, calibrated for life. 
But in order to verify that you haven't somehow damaged your product, we provide this measurement verification block, which includes inside of it optical test targets, which are NIST traceable. So this device is in fact a calibrated instrument with targets which have a six year calibration cycle associated with them. So at the end of six years, we can either recalibrate it for you or you can just buy a new one. It actually is the same price um, from us to do either of those uh, uh, activities. But you can see on this test target, um, there are crosshairs in uh, millimeters and in inches that the system will um, actually recognize. We have, we have a, an initial um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, pattern recognition software built in so when you put the video probe in with the stereo measurement tip and you say, I want to do a linear measurement, it'll actually recognize these targets and it'll automatically perform the measurement so you can see uh, what is my instrument uh, providing as a result from this calibrated, this calibrated uh, test target. So let me then just talk about a couple applications uh, that, uh, that we've uh, encountered here in uh, in providing uh, remote visual uh, borescope inspection. Again, here's that same uh, image that we were showing before. Uh, much more difficult to see under white light, uh, under FPI, uh, the indication uh, really pops out for you. Um, here's an interesting uh, UV inspection that uh, doesn't involve uh, FPI, but it in just involves uh, the, the fact that uh, in, in a uh, aircraft, in a turbine engine, uh, at least in a CFM-56, um, the, the oil actually fluoresces with a blue sheen. And so there is a, there is a, um, there is a seal uh, in a CFM-56 which was leaking, which was uh, coating uh, some of the components on the inlet of the engine with an oil sheen. And uh, looking just with a white light video boroscope, this looks pretty normal. What was actually going on was this, these entire surfaces were actually coated with oil, and under UV inspection, this oil would fluoresce purple. And this was a this was a pretty pretty big problem. They actually turned aircraft around because of the smell that develops in the cabin. So what when when the air is taken from the jet engine and fed into the cabin, it's called the bleed air. And so the the air actually goes over components of the engine, and if those components are oily and that oil vaporizes, you'll get what uh, is called in the industry a dirty sock smell in the cabin. And so, as I said, they've actually turned aircraft around because they thought there was some type of an oil leak in the engine itself or some other type of a problem. Uh, but uh, this, this is used for a diagnosis in, in an aircraft uh, application for looking for an oil seal leak. Uh, in, in automotive uh, industry, uh, the wax that is applied uh, as anti-corrosion material inside of uh, door panels and fender panels and inside of chassis uh, has got small little flakes of material that will fluoresce under, under uh, UV inspection. So you can see here this is all pretty good coverage. Uh, these two images is, just, is kind of a spotty coverage, incomplete coverage. So uh, remote visual uh, UV can be used for, for quality control inspection for uh, uh, anti-corrosion coatings. And so this is, um, this is the application that I just want to uh, give a little bit more information on right now. It's a deep well spool inspection. So a spool is a component that's deep inside of the uh, core of a, of a jet engine. Uh, the the uh, the blade rings are are uh, are put around the outside of this spool. They're bolted together and uh, and uh, go around the outer ring here. But when this is taken off for for an engine rebuild or a uh, some type of repair, there is now I, I said earlier this GE SPM and and so this SPM says that if you're going to take an engine and tear it down to this level you have to do 100% inspection of the interior of this spool. And so you can do it with your eyeball and a mirror and a handheld illuminator, but it's very, very difficult to do that. And it's very difficult to ensure that you've done 100% inspection. That's what this SPM is going to require is 100% inspection. So this tool essentially is just a big turntable that, that you can bolt the spool onto it's got an arm with an indicator dial that will move this. The video probe itself is down inside of here. It's down on an arm that is looking to the side here. 
So this arm moves up and down, and this arm moves in and out, and you can read out the actual dimensions of what it what it uh, is set for. And so there's a there's a manual that tells you to put this in place. It'll tell you to put it in place uh, with a given tip to target distance because, as I mentioned before, we went through and we verified that uh, a given tip had enough energy to meet their specifications. It was able to resolve the uh, the number of line pairs for the Air Force target that was required, and it met uh, it didn't exceed the UV, the white light uh, uh, energy levels. So this particular tool, um, when it was when it's used with this um, uh, uh, turntable assembly, which is made by Canyon Run Engineering, they are a, a engineering and machining operation uh, just outside of Cincinnati. This whole assembly has been accepted by GE Aviation as meeting the requirements of this SPM. And uh, this tool is available to uh, perform that inspection. And so how does this tool meet the requirements? Uh, so we have a forward view with a maximum viewing area. We uh, had no restrictions on the probe diameter, so we chose an 8.4 millimeter. We uh, verified we had 1,200 microwatts. We verified we had less than two foot candles of white light, and we had um, uh, in excess of 3.17 line pairs per millimeter. And so here's here's a typical uh, uh, stereo image. When we found a defect, we uh, we've got a test spool, and we went in with a uh, with a uh, screwdriver and a scribe and put some uh, defects in here. Here is a uh, stereo uh, measurement of a scratch that we put in here. It was measured at two thousandths of an inch uh, wide. Um, and this was done with our forward black stereo tip at, uh, if you're familiar with our product, MTD, that's the maximum target distance. We were 280 thousandths tip to target distance from the end of our video probe to the inside of this spool, which is being inspected. This um, deep well spool inspection uh, has been going on for a while. This uh, I was uh, digging up in preparation for this uh, particular uh, event uh, on the web, and I came across the fact that uh, back about 10 years ago, ASNT published a, uh, a paper on it, and they actually dip this entire spool assembly into, into a, a vat in order to prepare it. And uh, in the past, they uh, they used a mirror and a handheld inspection. Um, so this is a just a, a much more uh, rigorous method to ensure 100% coverage. Um, the the tool itself, we we Waygate Technologies do not sell the tool. Um, the tool is available from Canyon Run Engineering Technologies uh, in Troy, Ohio. They're just outside of Cincinnati. Uh, you can acquire from them uh, the uh, the tool only or the tool uh, with our video boroscope, or you can source our video boroscope locally. Um, I would uh, I would recommend local sourcing just to be able to get the support uh, you require uh, for setup and ongoing um, uh, maintenance uh, of our products. But uh, however you would like to acquire it, uh, it's just it is our standard eight millimeter video boroscope. It just uh, it just gets installed into their their system uh, and just gets laced in uh, through through uh, all of this um, uh, uh, captivating uh, uh, materials uh, to be able to be part of this system. So the installation is, is pretty simple. And that's all I have for the overall presentation. Um, I guess I would say thank you everyone for, for joining and uh, if there are, are any follow-up questions, um, we have this available. This is being recorded. We can provide a copy of it. We can provide uh, the uh, copy of the PowerPoint materials as well. So just um, contact us through our website or through your local Waygate Technologies representative.